<laughs> I go to this, this barber there. Uh -huh. Wild people. Yeah. On one side they have a mass murderer hanging on the wall, and on the other side all these beautiful girls. <laughs> Well, it's Eros and Thanatos. That's why the other one is Libido. Yeah, Einstein, they have the mass murderer Einstein. Yeah. I said, do you know that you have this mass murderer Einstein there? They didn't know that he was a mass murderer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the girls are better. Exactly. The girls are hanging there. The will to life. Well, I said, you are the artist. You cut it, so they cut it. Yeah. Can't help it. <laughs> okay, should we do that? Or do you want to call him if, if we could do it on Tuesday? Well, they indicated when I talked to them earlier that they wouldn't be able to do yeah. it during Holy Week. Maybe we should catch him when we can, huh? So, is it f affirmed now that we will come tomorrow morning? Yeah. If I don't call them and cancel yeah. it, then they're expecting us at 10.30. Okay, tomorrow. so then we... But they come late, right? Always the students. I can send them an email. Students? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, send them an email to go right away to St. Augustine. Okay. But I will go into the classroom. We go into the classroom so in case somebody doesn't get the message, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very risky thing. Then you have to take risks. Risk taker. Right, say. Risk takers. Isn't that why the risk takers get paid more, they always say? Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, let's do that. So, um, so we go there at 10 o'clock and send them all to St. Augustine. Because they're expecting us at 10.30. 10.30, so yes. So I'm going to indicate that in the email. Yeah, right. So. Tell them 10.30 in St. Augustine, Parish. Tell them on West Main, right? It's on West Main. Is that right? Yeah. I'll send them the address. Yeah. Tell them there is a little white St. Augustine who should really be black. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to volunteer to climb up and paint it black, you would go do, do a good deed. You have to do that to his mother, too. Mother is also black. They were both Africans, of course. Monica is in Florida. Monica, that was Monica, yes. She has to yeah. be painted black, too. And then there is Ambrose here. He's white. He was an Aryan. He was his teacher, his Augustine teacher. Uh, he was in Milano. Archbishop of Milano. Okay, are we ready? Now we have to think what uh, who we want to do. Schindler's List, Downfall of Hitler. Have you ever seen this movie, The Downfall of Hitler? Um, then there is his secretary uh, in person. There, it's a short thing we can look at this. Then Dustin gave me the wave there. Mm -hmm. That would fit too. Yeah, well, it's about how easy fascism can yeah. come back. We could, yeah, we could try that too. And then there's the judgment at Nuremberg. So you can meditate and see what you want. This is a democratic household here. Okay, that's one thing. Now, um, let's see what we do. Today is what. Number 10, I think, 8, 9, 9, 10, 10, okay, so first of all I want to give you the test back, that means one test this has to be given back, and that is your test, Alex. So let's talk about this very shortly, we did about the others already, you all did very well with your tests. Uh, we uh, said that we want to have the second test now and if you want to we don't have to have a third one so you don't have to have it today yet so uh, Alex you need one right? Yeah. You haven't gotten it yet. So we have another week we can make it also two weeks okay. if you want to have a third one you think it's necessary then we can have a third one otherwise we leave it with two right? and uh, use the day and the next time prepared a little bit more. <laughs> okay, this is Pathology of Reason and Therapy. Examine Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Alexander Feather, great scholar. Okay, Alex tried and dared to go into this Phenomenology of Spirit. 
You told us the last time that you would like to know a little bit more about the background, right? And where they come from, and so on. that's a very good idea. So, but this is one thing where they come from: the phenomenology of spirit. So, a phenomenology of mind, um, which Hegel wrote in Jena when Napoleon went through the city, and he thought that was the wor great world historical guy. Beethoven was uh, was also enthusiastic about Napoleon, but regretted it later. But um, Hegel regretted it too somehow because the French troops pushed him out of the city. He had to flee to Würzburg where he worked for a newspaper. And so the, he had the phenomenology in his pocket when he fled. Uh, they almost the French got it. It would never have come out. So that's the phenomenology. And um, in Jena, that is also the place where he had his illegitimate child, which he didn't want to remember. As a matter of fact, forgot it. Um, he had an affair with the house, with the lady of the house where he rented. Uh, her husband was uh, sick, and he promised her to marry her. Then, typically like philosophers, he forgot about it. As a matter of fact, he sometimes in Heidelberg, he came into the classroom and forgot his shoes because the shoes got stuck in the dirt outside, so he walked in without <laughs> shoes on. The you don't way. do that? Some strange things yeah, happened to the right. guy there, yeah. <laughs> he also, he... Uh, what is that called when you put the tobacco in your nose? Snuff. Snuffed, yeah, he snuffed. And so he told when he was, he had to teach after Napoleon, uh, he had no job, so he was the, the, the director of a gymnasium, humanistic gymnasium. And there he taught Latin and also philosophy and so on, and then he snuffed all the time. He went to the corner that they wouldn't see it. And then he taught him not to snuff. <laughs> and that just, <laughs> I was a hypocrite. Well, the, uh, his father-in-law didn't give him the daughter Marie Marie Tucher Marie von Tucher she was nobility so but the director of a gymnasium that was too pitiful so he couldn't get her these were different times when when hours and the, the potential of sex potential of work potential of recognition were not yet so completely separated as it is for us so in order to get a girl, you had to go to the parents, and you had to have recognition, you had to be somebody, if he was somebody, um, and then you had to have a job, you had to feed her. So, um, but so the, the status of a high school guy was not high enough. And we still have that in Germany. There's a woman who writes to me all the time, and I grew up with her, and she was a capitalist's daughter. And he, he, the fiancé she had, or the guy she wanted to marry, um, he had a doctorate, but he was not a professor. So therefore, the whole family was against it. Couldn't marry her. And, uh, well, then she married anyway, and she went to the honeymoon to Rome, to the Vatican. I mean, that ruins everything. So the marriage only lasted a year, and that was the end of it. But it was enough for a son, so she had a son, and then uh, got divorced and never married again catastrophe. So so it still reaches in our presence. You know, the Katya always tells me that this is all over. <laughs> but the past is present in the present and even into the future. <laughs> One cannot get away from it. So nevertheless that was the phenomenology. And Karl Marx, of course, talk, took that as the basis too. <laughs> they went from idealism then to materialism, presupposition, instead of idealistic presupposition, God's providence and so on, they of nature as a starting point, but otherwise the phenomenology was for them the way how man created himself through work. And there is a famous chapter in there which Alex saw probably, and that is the struggle between master and servant. That is the pattern of the class struggle. So from there they took the class struggle, and it's described very beastly how master and servant are fighting against each other. That was, of course, at that time still the feudal lord and the serf, but later on it was the capitalist and the worker, the wage laborer. It's a struggle for life and death. And you can see that struggle going on you know, in Congress every day where one party represents the upper class and their money, the none will be taxed, the other one defends its entitlement and so on, and it goes back and forth and doesn't move anywhere. So, uh, because, yeah, because we don't have a Labour Party, so 
we don't have anybody who represents the 200 million and we have only two bourgeois parties they really both are for the class system as we said but one of them want to be a little more lenient give them something the 200 million uh, you know minimum wage and so on in order to keep them happy while the others are much more rigorous and Dustin is writing a book on that guy there um, and, and this whole background of selfishness is good and, you know, to dominate and exploit and, and so on and so on that this is all a very good thing by the way there was a horrible exam which was even too much for the republicans um, there was a guy who wanted to uh, apologize to the black people for that they had been enslaved and somebody got up in the Republican Party in some kind of congressional meeting and he said, apologize, what should he apologize for? He gave them room and board. <laughs> <laughs> and you translate this now into the capitalistic system, it would mean, why should the capitalists apologize to the workers? They gave them a job, they gave them a job. See. But what is left out and what you have to put in the clear text is the surplus value, of course. They got a job only because they could be exploited. And as we said already, Walter, whom you don't know, young Walter, his father discovered that 20 years ago, that whatever job he took, he was just hired, not for his nice face or intelligence or whatever, but for the surplus value he produced. And so he refused to work at all, which means, of course, that now he has only $1,000 in, uh, in Social Security with which you cannot live and not die, neither of the two. So you have to work, and you... Uh, are forced to work in spite of the fact that you know that every work you do uh, means exploitation. And uh, this is, you know, otherwise you starve to death. And you have no health insurance, so you die. Because the health insurance they connect it to, and that's so liberalism, you know, which comes from Calvinism, um, which has a very pessimistic anthropology. People are lazy and so on. So Therefore, you have to, they don't want to work really. In order to work, you connect the health insurance to the job. No job, no health insurance, die. And they even justify that with the Bible because St. Paul said, who does not work should not eat. If you don't eat, you die. Of course, his master Jesus, whom he didn't know, of course, had said, look at the birds. They don't work and eat, nevertheless, see how happy they are. And Adorno was horribly upset that the New Testament, you know, dared to put those contradictions before an intelligent person. Uh, so, and there are many, many of those contradictions, of course. But it could be explained, of course, in a different stage of the Jesus community. When they were still in the beginning, it was one thing. When they finally became more established, it was another thing. Okay, nevertheless, then there is a third one who also was uh, very much interested about the, the phenomenology of spirit, and that was uh, our fellow there, the uh, Marxist uh, playwright, Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht. I think I told you already that uh, Brecht was a nihilist originally, came from Augsburg in Germany. His grandmother already hated priests and ministers, and he inherited this. And uh, then one night he was in Berlin, Bertolt Brecht, uh, B-R-E-C-H-T. Uh, one of you has just uh, done a dissertation there in the political science with me on Bertolt Brecht, and he is new now in Munich doing his habilitation, so you can go up in the world. On the other hand, our Dieter Hennige thought he would go down in the world. He had written his dissertation in Munich about Brecht and then came here and his father-in-law said you cannot make it with us, go into administration. Whoever cannot teach or ever cannot do research goes into administration. And he was very good in administration so he did a wonderful <laughs> job here so that was the thing. But not that the history knows about it, that's only we know about it. <laughs> but Brecht um, then was in Berlin and uh, the workers marched one December night after the First World War and the police came in, shut him to pieces and he was standing on a balcony and saw this so they saw the glass struggle right in front of him <coughs> and that converted him and he became, that night he became a Marxist and stayed a Marxist for the rest of his life. When Hitler came into power he had already written the three penny opera, very critical of bourgeois society and so the Nazis were after him. He uh, then fled from Germany through the Soviet Union, but uh, strangely 
enough, he did not stay in the Soviet Union. A woman who was very dear to him, he had to leave her behind in Moscow because she was too ill and she died. Then when he was somewhat on the way to the United States, he, he died and it was a very horrible shock for his life. He went to Los Angeles, he worked for the uh, Los Angeles for the for the movie uh, thing, he wrote some things for them, made a living somehow. There was a huge German emigrant uh, um, settlement there in Los Angeles. Thomas Mann was there, and Frankfurt School people, some of them were there. So um, that uh, so he well he uh, at least made a living. Not like Thomas Mann. Some of them were very rich and huge houses, and others were poor little devils. And so this uh, Brecht was rather among the poor ones. Then. He was, after the Second World War, he was invited to the Un-American Activities Committee, which was a right-wing organization which looked for communists everywhere. Remember, when we look at the critical theory, we have uh, liberalism, liberal society, that's where they come from, and then socialism comes up because of the injustice in civil society, and then the low bourgeois fascists come in order to rescue the capitalist system, and put the communists into concentration camp or kill them. So Hitler did that classically, but we started, and he saw that in these three volumes there, and one chapter I describe it, where this Ludwig Gauss went to the funeral of uh, communists who had been murdered in, in New York, and, and uh, the workers all went with him to, um, to the funeral of the, and at that time Marx was still alive <coughs> in London. So, so we know that uh, uh, liberals, and fascists and Catholics hate communism, which does not make them the same. They are very different, but one thing is makes them they have in common, that is this hate for uh, for communism. So, uh, therefore, he had to come there, and he went to the session, and um, he had made a deal through his lawyer <laughs> that he would answer a certain question in a wrong way. The, everybody who came there was asked, have you been, are you a member of the Communist Party? And so he had not been a member of the American Communist Party, but he had been a member of the German Communist Party. So they implied some Jesuitism. And um, as, said, as if the question was, were you a member of the Communist Party in general, they understood it as way a member of the American Communist Party. They added a little bit and that, so they said no. And he had a big cigar and he smoked it right with all the senators there. And then they showed him a picture in order to prove that he was a Marxist. <coughs> and they read this, this poem to him and, and in English and he said, I've never heard this before. <laughs> and then they fought the German original text. Ah, he said, yes, I wrote this. I remember I wrote this. So, uh, it was another dirty trick. But he had already the ticket in his uh, pocket to Switzerland. So he went to Switzerland and in Switzerland he was invited by the German Democratic Republic in Pankow. It was the capital besides Berlin. They put that thing in the... I still saw their, their um, diet building there. So, uh, horrible architecture. But uh, that's, the, that's where he went. They gave him a nice house in Berlin. Berlin was bombed out, like our German cities were bombed out to 80%. Uh, but there were some houses left, and he got a nice house. <coughs> and he traveled back and forth, back in, to Germany and so on. He didn't go to Augsburg very often. He often, obviously hated that city, but he, uh, you know, his, his plays were uh, uh, played in, in Germany, in Cologne, in Frankfurt, and so on, and he was there sometimes. So until the wall was built, and uh, I think we talked about this wall once. We have a wrong picture. I just told Katya today again, her main task would be, you know, to counteract somehow this horrible propaganda which we have in this country about what happened under the Soviets and so on. So Katya grew up there, and there she could, can tell more honestly what happened. But nevertheless, um, you know, Reagan went there and said, Mr. Gorbachev, take this wall down in spite of the fact that it had nothing to do with the Russians. Uh, the Russians didn't want the wall. So six years before the wall was erected, uh, the Germans 
planned that. And the reason was because the intellectuals went left. So they educated these people freely as engineers and so on. And then they left for West Germany because they got... Uh, hey, how are you? Good, how are you? They, um, hey, they don't have any snow in Riyadh, do they? No. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's raining over there right now. I know. The camels would all die. It would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is a chair somewhere. Can you get a chair from somewhere? Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe upstairs in the kitchen, wherever oh, you want. Yeah. I mean, you can yeah. take my chair in the back there if you want to. No, I'll get it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, where was I? Yeah, there was a wall. So, and so they want to build the wall in order to keep the people whom they had trained because they offered them, you know, double or three times the salary when they go to West Germany and so. Uh, so the Russians said, this is very bad propaganda for socialism and uh, uh, don't do it, you know. So they didn't do it for several years, and, but then it got too bad and they built the wall anyway. Um, and uh, the the argument which the Germans had was, you know, we, uh, the Russians, that's interesting, the Russians quite rationally said, you just have to make a bit of better society. If you have a better society, then people will stay with you. And then the Germans argued, of course, number one, you stole everything from this country. They took all the whales and everything out. So East Germany had to pay reparations for Russia, while West Germany had not to pay anything. Well, of course it went better over there. Then the West Germans had got the, the, uh, the Marshall Plan to rebuild everything. East Germany did not get the Marshall Plan. By the way, the Marshall Plan was offered to East Germany but they didn't accept it because it would destroy their socialism. The Marshall Plan was also offered to Russia, but they were also afraid that they had fought for communism and then it would go under because they would take the Marshall Plan. So, uh, and, uh, so the Germans were quite frank in their discussions with the Soviets, and so it's, it's very difficult for us you know, to compete with the fury of, the, of, uh, of uh, West Germany with all that money and, and all that help, and you didn't give us any help. So, uh, well, so finally the Russians didn't give any help and they couldn't make it much better. <laughs> and so they built the wall then, which was, of course, a, a great mistake. So the Where I lived my youth, the where I had my paradise as a little boy, that was in the death zone between the two. And there were bombs and everything they had put in the ground, so in case tanks would go over them. And so it's very dangerous. So all my friends there, the castle where my uncle was, it was all in that death zone, and one couldn't go in from one side or the other side. And funny enough, that's two or three days ago, uh, somebody wrote to me from the village, which was in the death zone, uh, who owns the restaurant of my family. It's the restaurant of the White Horse. The White Horse. It's a tiny little village. I mean, maybe 200 people or whatever. It goes on for centuries, and one doesn't even know why why it survived. So it survived, you know, the Weimar Republic and the fascist thing, and then the the Americans came in first, and then the Americans left, and the Russians came in, and then they were in the death zone, <laughs> and came out of the death zone, so they're there. So and he, um, he wanted to know a little bit. I visited the place, and uh, he's a student, and he studies engineering now, but he lives in that little place where my <laughs> grandfather came from, and the 12 people, 12 children they had in that inn, the White Horse, my grand-grandfather, and five came to America, and one made it in, uh, made it in Rochester. He got it married into Bausch and Lamb. That's the way how you get up, marrying in the White Club. Well, that's a good advice. So, and so um, he was the only one then who could go back, uh, uh, travel back to the 20s and visit that little place, Bosch, there. And one last picture, my grandfather, he was uh, then lived with my uncle, the judge, and he said all day long, he said, and I think I should do that too, he sat at the window and looked at that little place, Bosch it was called, where he came from, and meditated this and thought about his life. And one day he had written five books, uh, some kind of a diary, 
in which he wrote every egg or every piece of bread which he bought. He was a teacher, poor teacher, and let two sons go to college, and uh, one became an electrician, that was my father. And so he started to take these books apart. <laughs> he took one page out after the other and threw it in the fire. He obviously had an attack of depression, and he thought that all these eggs he bought, they were really for nothing. <laughs> It was the, the, time, the whole thing, the whole life. And so the housekeeper of my uncle, he, she ran to him and said, your father is doing strange things. So my, my uncle then went to old man and uh, took the thing out. He didn't fight it, you know, but he rescued it. And it's downstairs. I have all the five volumes there with all the little things written in, which he spent half a pound of butter and half a liter of milk and so on. So, um, no, let's not disturb by this. Okay, now back to this Brecht, uh, Bertolt Brecht, who, by the way, uh, knew the Frankfurt School people. He knew Adorno and Horkheimer. He observed how they got rounder and rounder, particularly <laughs> Adorno got rounder and rounder and gained in weight, and he made fun about no the Frankfurters. What is this? My daughter probably from New York. Yes, I knew it, I knew it. Don't be disturbed by children. She gives a little speech now. She does that every day when she comes back. She is working in a working in a corporation where she's the lawyer of the corporation and she has to look at the cheating of advertisement. No, it's not Jeannie, it was Agnes. That's the director of the nurses here. That's when you have <laughs> seven children, eight children, and 14 grandchildren. It never ends. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so um, the, uh, so the, the, as far as Brecht is concerned, so, uh, the, so he was not part of the critical theory people, right? So we, we have a very definite uh, view of what that is, the critical theory. You know, everybody's critical, and there is this and this critical. But we mean a very specific one, and that is the Frankfurt School people. So Brecht knew the Frankfurters, and uh, <coughs> he knew one particularly well, and that was Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin becomes very famous now again, not only my God is working on him again, Fromm becomes very famous again. They were not exactly in the center of the critical theory, they were more on the border, and people become now again interested in them. I just got a new book, Dustin. I also ordered it, the uh, new life story about, uh, about Fromm, which is very good. So, <coughs> nevertheless, we want to, uh, you know, get a picture of the Frankfurt School business. So, when Brecht then uh, came out, uh, he <coughs> moved out of his house. I think it never belonged to him anyway. Um, and he moved into an apartment on the Dorothean, Dorothean uh, Cemetery which was in the eastern part of Berlin, which was behind the wall on the other side. And um, so he wanted, in his testament, he wrote that he wanted to be buried with Hegel. Now that's very interesting, right? So Hegel is that giant uh, whom we have to know a little bit, you know, if you want to go deeper into the critical theory, and particularly Hegel's logic, and particularly Hegel's phenomenology. This phenomenology is the way into the logic. So the logic is his main philosophy, and the phenomenology leads into this. Uh, uh, so, And um, Reich was also very much uh, enthusiastic about the phenomenology. And as a Marxist, he read the phenomenology every day, and he read the Bible every day. Didn't believe a word. He thought we would die like the animals. But uh, he was nevertheless uh, interested in this great philosophy. <coughs> and so what you have today is, you know, even when people are opposed to Hegel because they are materialists or whatever, nobody doubts that he was the greatest thinker which modernity ever had on the level of Aristotle or Plato and so on. And also the fate, our, our own, we want to have a discourse in which we uh, reflect on ourselves, who we are. Unfortunately, we live in a culture which had the chance, you know, and uh, it was the... Um, the, what, what was this writer there? The, um, you know, Dustin, you know, this, uh, the fellow who wrote uh, The Leaves of Grass, Leaves of Grass. Oh, hmm? Steinbeck? 
No, no, not Sabek. Leaves of Grass. He lived about 1800, 1890 or whatever. Famous guy. He um, put the whole Hegel into into poetry, and um, he uh, said, you know, the, the great nation needs a great philosopher. Hegel is that great philosopher, and they followed him up to the First World War, to the Great Depression, when they then turned against dialectical thinking and went up to the formalistic type of a logic, which you have on campus when you have to take a course on critical thinking, then you get formalistic logic, so it's not the dialectical logic, it's before the dialectical logic, uh, before Kant and before Hegel. So that is very unfortunate, and we just discussed that already enough. So, And so he read that... Uh, up to the end, and he really was buried beside Hegel, uh, not beside Hegel, a little bit on the other side of the little path, and so he's buried there with his wife. Um, also, Hegel wanted to be buried beside, I don't know what they have with burying all the time, but he wanted to be buried beside Fichte, the philosopher from whom he learned a lot, and he was buried beside Fichte. The wives are in between, so... Uh, and the graves are taken care of whenever I went there. We went, uh, my God, I went there went every year that's almost. Hegel's grave right yeah, there, that's, right? That's where it is. There, yeah, this one there. Well, Beside wait a minute. The cart. Oh, that is his gravestone. Yeah, you're yeah, right. That's we can take it down there. You can. Oh. It was Whit it is, Whitman yeah. that wrote. Oh, days. Whitman. Yeah, Whitman. That's right. Whitman. Remember him, Whitman. Yeah. Hegel's grave. Yeah, that's Hegel's grave there. And. Um, uh, on the grave there is no cross. His wife has a cross. It's always a question if he was a Christian or not. <laughs> the um, wife has a cross. Fichte has some kind of architecture and his wife has a cross too. Um, what Hegel has on his grave is an altar. It is the Holocaust altar of the first temple in Jerusalem. Um, because from his philosopher of history that, uh, where he talks about the slaughter bench of history or the Golgotha, the Holocaust of, um, of history. That is where it was taken from. <laughs> okay, so um, he also, on one hand, uh, Brecht uh, thought we died like the animals, and Hans Küng uh, answered that. He had a counter poem to it, and uh, he also wrote that he wanted to make sure that he was really dead, so the doctors had to put a knife into his heart in order to make sure that he would not wake up in the grave again. That would have been very unfortunate. <coughs> okay, so um, that brings us uh, to this, um, back to this uh, paper here, which is a very good paper. Um, and I wrote something there about he believes in the progress of man towards truth. Spirit has broken with the old order of things and so on. So, of course, the um, uh, we find here, in spite of the fact that the logic had not yet been really written, that was the introduction to the logic, um, but the logic is already at work. And dialectics means determinate negation. So what Hegel thinks is, here in this phenomenology, is that different forms of human consciousness, like sense perception or a sense certainty, and analytical understanding, which you learn here on our campus, uh, which is also the basis for the bourgeois enlightenment, uh, and then dialectical reason, and so on. Uh, all these stages, one stage negates the previous one. So every stage leads to despair that one cannot really know. So it's a struggle between the object, the subject, and the object. Uh, sense perception gives us some sense of that tree, we see something and so on, then we see how, in, uh, how, uh, how insufficient that is, and then we have the approach of a, of a biologist or of a, uh, um, a scientist or whatever who looks at it on analytical understanding. And so uh, subject and object come closer and closer to each other until at the end uh, absolute knowledge is reached. So. Absolute knowledge means that subject and object are now identical. That means the human mind has penetrated the tree, its form, its assimilation process in terms of warmth, in terms of radiation, in terms of the material the roots take out of the ground, assimilation, and then the process of uh, reproduction. 
that means the species act in which the tree uh, develops um, seeds which fall out and then a new uh, uh, a new, uh, new tree comes up that's how the species keeps itself alive so the species uh, process is the goal of the whole thing the form is the basis and so on. so the more you penetrate on the basis of a direct reason you go penetrate deeper than on the basis of uh, analytical understanding where you take certain aspects of the tree and categorize them in terms of species and genus and so on. So um, that, uh, that is what the phenomenology is. Uh, it is these stages uh, in which subject and object come closer and closer to each other. They continually go through a despair about a certain form of consciousness and that despair leads into a new one in which one becomes a little bit more certain and so it goes on until absolute knowledge is achieved. <laughs> there were two arguments against this absolute knowledge. Once the positivists laugh about it because in 1800 uh, he applied that logic to nature and he talked about the sun which particularized itself and singularized itself in the moons and uh, particularized that into planets and then singularized into moons and uh, there he said you know there were seven and seven was the right number of this uh, self-particularization, self-singularization of the sun system. And in the same year, the eighth planet was uh, discovered. And <laughs> so the empiricist then found another one and shows that the whole notion of the sun system, that this was uh, not adequate and that was not science and, and so on and so on. And another thing is also positive went to Auschwitz and uh, stood there and then he said this happens when you have aspired to absolute knowledge now, first of all the Nazis did not aspire to absolute knowledge and uh, the rabbis who died in the camps they had absolute knowledge so the religious people do have absolute knowledge of uh, the Trimurti Brahma or, or Tao or uh, nothingness in terms of uh, these are all definitions of the absolute, so they all define the absolute. Hegel's logic is a whole series of definitions of the absolute. The absolute is being, the absolute is becoming, the absolute is something, the absolute is the measure of all things, the absolute is a conclusion, and so on. So that means the whole logic is a theology. And the interesting thing is that then Lenin and so on, Lenin made out of it the ABC of uh, of a revolution. It's not easy for a materialist uh, to transform an idealistic, and all great philosophy has been idealistic so far, to transform that into materialism. So that's the reason why there is no materialistic logic. That means they should have superseded Hegel's idealistic logic with a materialistic one, and would have started maybe not with being, as Adorno thought, or nothing, but with something. Something is one stage of the logic. So but even that did not happen. Marcuse wanted to uh, write a book with all the others together about um, materialistic elements in the great idealistic philosophies, but also that did not happen. So, And that is not by accident that 100 years or 200 years after Marx there is still no materialistic logic there uh, because maybe it cannot be done. But uh, it's, it's a, for me, it's a funny type of a thing that you know anti-theologians really uh, take a, a logic which is entirely a logic from every one step to the other. So it is up to the idea, which is the God Himself, and the uh, stages are definitions in which it becomes more and more concrete in the logic until finally the idea contains being and contains. Uh, nothingness mm -hmm. and contains something. All these steps mm -hmm. are contained in the idea, finally. And, uh, it all goes back to Anselm of Canterbury's proof of the uh, ontological proof of God's existence, where we have this highest idea. The highest idea must contain being and everything else, otherwise it would not be the highest idea, therefore God exists. So uh, Hegel is the last one who followed this uh, um, Anthem of Canterbury uh, theory of the ontological proof of God <laughs> and takes it as the foundation of all the other proofs. Now what has happened to us 
again is that already before Kant, the prejudice came up in the third estate that God cannot be known. And that is what everybody thinks today, too. So people are all agnostics on our campus. And they are not only agnostics about the absolute, but also about the uh, psyche. So that Skinner would say it's a black box and so on, which means they're agnostic about man as well. And these two things hang together. <laughs> and um, Nietzsche made fun of Kant because Kant uh, proved that the ontological proof is not possible. Why, typically for a bourgeois, he said, when you have the idea of ten dollars, it doesn't mean that you really have them. So <laughs> that means the notion and being fall apart. And of course, Anselm said that for all finite things, that is true, because no finite thing is with necessity. All finite things are contingent. There's only one notion which is with necessity, and that is the notion of the, of the God. So, um, and uh, that argument which Kant uh, had, it was already done by a little monk at the time, the year thousand, at the time of uh, Anselm in, in Canterbury, who argued that way already. And so Kant took took that up again. When I discuss with Kant, uh, uh, with uh, my friend housekeeper here all the time, then uh, she thinks, you know, that somehow the world starts in the 20th or 21st century or whatever. But all what people think has something to do with all that what has thought before. And if it is only that it becomes conscious, unconscious. So the consciousness, you know, not only that sex can be unconscious, as Freud made it clear, and that then enlightenment means that the unconscious becomes conscious, or that where it is, ego is. But that can happen with God as well. And so somehow with the bourgeois revolution, the absolute became unconscious. And the, the catastrophes which we have have something to do with this. The, the breakdown of the ontological proof had effects in art, in philosophy, in, uh, in the sciences, in politics, and everywhere. Adorno still has little tiny fragments of this ontological proof. And there are some, uh, some positivists in Lansing who uh, have tried to, uh, to restore that uh, the ontological proof again, but uh, it hasn't worked so far. Um, okay, so that about this. So important here is that it is the description, phenomenology is the description of human consciousness. It is a description of different forms of human consciousness. It's a description of forms of human consciousness as they follow each other. And as they follow each other in terms that each new form of consciousness negates the negativity of the previous one and at the same time preserves the positive elements of the previous one and adds a new dimension to it, all in the continual struggle against despair the despair of not being able to know. Uh, Marx said that already early on, and we read this, you know, that man may be the only being who does not reach his, desi does not reach his destination. That the destination of man is to know the truth, and he doesn't get there. And agnosticism means that one reconciles oneself with this absence of knowledge and vegetates on. So... Okay, so to determine, and that we have that, you know, in the logic too, then, which is time-wise later, but which was already there before, um, and uh, that also goes in, in terms of this uh, determinate negation. So being is negated um, by, uh, uh, by nothing, and uh, nothing negates being, and so on, so, but uh, the, uh, we, we move from being to nothing, and both is negated in becoming. Becoming contains these two elements, being and nothing. Because becoming means that you go from being to nothing. You have a little embryo, and then you have an abortion. You put something into being, and then you remove something, negate something. And the totality of these two elements, that is becoming then. Right? And then it goes on from becoming to something, and so on and so on. So the whole system is that way. Now, these abstract concepts like being and nothing have their root, of course, in the history of philosophy. That means they have been discovered by people. So Parmenides would say being is and nothing is not, thereby excluding becoming. 
the Buddha would say nothing is, being is not, thereby include, excluding becoming. So no matter how abstract these things may sound, they are rooted, of course, in how many this belong to the upper classes. The Buddha belonged to the upper class. He was a noble man. The upper classes don't like becoming because becoming means that they are and that they have a good time but that they are on the way out. The capitalists know exactly that the same thing will happen to them what happened to the feudal lords. The feudal lords knew that the same thing would happen to them which happened to the capitalists, to the slaveholders. So um, this, therefore, all ruling classes want to create the impression that uh, things have always been that way and that they will be that way and that there will be no, uh, no change and this consciousness of the ruling class is then in socialized into the masses of the people so that they then believe that there will be nothing new. And that guarantees, you know, relatively the stability of things for some time. When the masses of the people get the consciousness that their ruling class is transitory, if masses of the 200 million would say, our ruling class, first of all, that they know that they have one, our ruling class will not last the same way like the slaveholders and the feudal lords did not last, then, uh, of course, it would be the beginning of the end already. But as long as they think, you know, things are as they are, as long as they are positivists, that means you have to adjust, you have to bind your brain to what is the case, that's the definition of positivism, so long as there is stability. And that is why they reject its dialectics in the Great Depression. There was unbelievable, uh, like we had it again here in 2008, uh, insecurity about, um, about the economic situation, and they didn't want to have another destabilizing factor there by people thinking dialectically. Because dialectically thinking means that all forms are finite. All forms of domination are finite. Even for Marx, the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity will not be eternal. It will be much better the bourgeoisie was, it will, the real human, is now it's only just animal history, what we have now, and just look at the news, but it will become real human history, but it will be transitory, it will be finite as well. That is the basis why, the, why Christians and Marxists could work together and do work together in Argentina and everywhere else, as long as the Marxists say that this um, uh, realm of freedom on the realm of necessity, uh, as long as they uh, uh, say that's finite, it does not uh, uh, sort of compete with the kingdom of God. And so only if the Marxists would say, we secularize the kingdom of God, and this I'll turn to future three, that is the kingdom of God, then Christians and Marxists could not work together. But they're working together very nicely. And there's some, some stupid ones still. <laughs> okay, so that is the phenomenology, and um, it is not easy to read, to write the whole thing, and in our philosophy department, they know that they should read it, but they say it takes a whole lifetime, therefore we don't have to, we shouldn't even start. So uh, apply also to the history of religion there, as well as to the history of philosophy, and then Kuhn there, uh, if all you wrote here, if all philosophers were to earnestly seek truth, new systems would be filled with content more quickly, and never systems advance from the insights of both the old and the new, and a synthesis which uh, transcends the antagonism of apparent contradictions could be realized. So, uh, what I say here is uh, that was applied also to religion by Hans Küng, and Hans Küng used the positive Kuhn with his paradigm idea. That means that um, that different paradigms, uh, like the uh, um, the uh, Copernicus paradigm or the Galileo paradigm or the earlier Egyptian paradigm, in which all the uh, sacred writings are written, the Torah and the New Testament and so on, they, they, we have a uh, Newton paradigm and then we have an Einstein paradigm and Heisenberg paradigm. So the sciences move in paradigms and the paradigms, the elements remain the same. So um, that means you have an idea that there's a sun, of course, and there's the earth. But you think the sun turns around the earth because it looks like that. 
Now, the next paradigm, you find out that the Earth turns around the Sun. So, so the new paradigm sees things in a different way, but it's the same things which it sees. So that is what the paradigm is. Now, Hans Kuhn took that and applied it also to the history of religion. <laughs> and so you have uh, then uh, the Judaism goes through certain paradigms, and Christianity, uh, and, and Islam, and so all the others. And you could say that one the transition from one paradigm to the other, one religion to the other, is also a paradigm change. And that now that we have left uh, modernity behind, 1917, uh, we are on the way to a new paradigm. <laughs> that means the end of the bourgeoisie, the end of civil society, and, and so on and so on. That is in the making, and that what uses this insecurity and that struggle and in the in the Congress and all these decisions and so on, and the debt and the cipher crisis, which we can discuss there, and the Greek crisis and so on. So all the capitalistic system are in, in horrible shape, and they try to rescue, and you know they try their best, but um, it is not just another depression in which they are in now, but um, th this fiscal not fiscal, but the finance crisis, of finance capitalism, speculative capital, and so on. That was a disaster which had, in that form, never happened before, not even 1929. So, so that, as far as, you know, to, to um, the Hans Kuhn uh, is a uh, Sandalian, and he used then Kuhn and his positivistic paradigm. Not everybody would agree with that, uh, so I, I have tried it out. Uh, also, my friend there, who um, died there, the, the um, Gunther Bishop, he uh, tried in the religion department too. He used it several times. Uh, the least what one can say it is uh, pedagogically, it is very good. So you can somehow order masses of material and put some order into it when you say oh, Judaism started with a tribal paradigm and then there was an empire paradigm and a world religious empire and so on. Or you can say Judaism, there was first you know, Moses, uh, from Abraham to Moses, and then there was a monarchical paradigm, and then exile paradigm, and then a rabbinical paradigm, and then uh, uh, postmodern paradigm, and so on. So you can order things well. Um, so that, that, that's quite helpful. So <laughs> so this is about, that's what I meant. And I just pointed this out, that, this can, that one can remember this and, and read this. Um, so, um, cultural toolbox, it's cultural toolbox, that is, sounds a little too positivistic for me, but if you like it, you can have it. Um, how can we move beyond Hegel? Of course, that is, that is the question. So, one can apply his, say, his dialectics and say, you know, that also he has to be determinately legated. And uh, that is what he thought should do, but unf unfortunately nobody has done it. So um, that means um, what happens very often is that there is an Aristotle or Plato or the Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, and they uh, put a curse on people so that for centuries people have to write commentary on it. So in a certain sense, the critical theory is still a commentary on Hegel. So it's Marx, and so are the right-wing Hegelians, so it's Parsons, and so on. They're all writing their own, so it's existentialism, there's Heidegger, and so on. They all write commentaries. The question is not only to write a commentary, but to overcome Hegel, as Hegel tried to overcome Kant and Fichte and Schelling. There's Kant try to overcome the uh, empiricist in England and the and the rationalist in France and so on. So uh, as long as one does not do that well, this determinate negation, he will always pop up again in one's back. So simply to say I cannot read the uh, phenomenology means that it stays in your back and it will always catch up with you again. It is like an individual who uh, has something in his life and he doesn't deal with it, tries to forget it or whatever. It always pops up in his dreams or somehow. So, and uh, <coughs> so for the, the, that means we have land behind us, but we don't see any land before us. And therefore, pedagogically.
logically, if you don't have any land before you, it is good to remember, uh, you know, the, the in, in the back. So, um, in, concretely, Adorno thought that since the Marxist attempts to uh, uh, to uh, not only to study history but also to make it and transform it, since this did not work, that means it did not work in. In 1870, when the commune, the fourth estate, rose, it did not work in 1871, when it rose, it did not work in Germany, in Hamburg, in Munich, in 1917. It did work in Petersburg and in Moscow, but then uh, it, uh, it fell not to fascism, but to neoliberalism in 1989. And uh, that does not mean its end, but uh, it also doesn't mean that it has been realized. They called it in the Soviet Union realized socialism, but it was really realized. It was at best one stage on the way to communism, but it didn't much go much further. And so now the Chinese continue this, the North Korean and, and so on, and it will be continued uh, in a certain way. But Adorno thought that since one had these disappointments, it would be good now to. Um, to interpret history again in a new way before one can put it into a new praxis. So and that means that one would go to from Marx to Hegel again in order to recover what Marx may not have seen or where he may have made mistakes. When a great thinker makes a mistake, a tiny thing in his thought, it appears sooner or later in the streets as a catastrophe. That is why for a thousand years thinkers were not mad. Marriage is very distractive, and the family can be an unbelievable uh, hindrance to uh, straight thinking. And not only for the thinker, but also for his family. <laughs> it can be a crucifixion for his family as well. To be married to somebody who is thinking is a very, a very strenuous type of a thing. So <laughs> and, uh, the, when Hegel got married, he was aware of this. Uh, Maria Tucher was 20 years younger, and Hegel had great uh, quarrels if he could really impose that on the little girl who loved him so much. And uh, there are some love letters uh, of him to her, which, are, which, are, which we still have today, <coughs> in which he expresses this. But it went well. So um, the marriage went well for 20 years to last 20 years when he died and then she died 20 years later so you remember when we asked Michael or Mary Mary Ott which is Michael's <laughs> wife yeah. what it was like to be married to a critical theorist and she says the reason why I'm on Prozac poor <laughs> 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 oh, <sure>, Mike <laughs> Dustin can you see my, my water in the back there yeah on my desk there oh, yeah uh, yeah but you know they all lived in celibacy and when I taught Exford, at Oxford there for summer, I found out that even after they became Protestant, thank you, the professors still lived in celibacy up to 1850 or 60 or something like that. So they continued the celibacy status. You know, that doesn't mean that everybody who lives in celibacy is a great thinker or so, but, but it was the, the idea that, that it was painful for the family and it was the family, it was painful for the family, but it was also a hindrance for thinking and every mistake which he would make in thinking it would show sooner or later. And the mistakes I mean, which Marx made, and Hockheimer points them out by the way, and others too, um, then have certain consequences. Um, wherever Marx became a victim of the dialectics of enlightenment, that then shows. And therefore it would be good to go to Hegel's uh, teacher, that means to Kant and to Hegel, and we think again uh, what went wrong and why the neoliberals, in spite of their superficiality and their stupidity, could nevertheless win that uh, uh, that 1989 uh, counter-revolution. Because that was quite an amazing thing because they had tried in 1920, they went in the capitalists with 12 armies uh, against Lenin and they were beaten. And then Hitler went with three million men, and he was beaten. That then they were able to, without Gorbachev, they would not be able to, of course. Uh, he did his own mistakes, and Katya hates him, uh, because and many Russians do for the unbelievable betrayal 
uh, that he delivered practically the uh, the Russians to the to the West. So they had fought, you know, three times practically, two times successfully, and had lost millions and millions, 27 million people against Hitler. And then comes the whole comes the Western ruling class again and penetrates again there. Um, this is catastrophic, you know, the whole thing. And it will not remain that way. So, um, <coughs> but for the moment, it is a very sad story. Okay, so therefore it makes sense to um, to look again there, but uh, Hegel will not remain neither. So uh, he must not be fetishized for something like that. So um, he has to be overcome, but that will need hard work to overcome him and to, to go back behind uh, Marx and to rethink again Hegel's logic. That means also that one is able to overcome Hegel's logic and develop a new one. And what uh, Hanif, Hanif and Habermas do, that is this attempt. So they start with Hegel's struggle for recognition or his language and memory and then try to overcome his system and go forward. That is an impetus. But have they done so? No, they haven't done so. Right? That is an attempt. And our discourse is part of this attempt. <coughs> okay. Um, I think that is about it. Thank you very much. Good work, Alex. All three of you, you have done wonderful work. Very good. Mm. Okay, we can celebrate this tomorrow. Alex and I will celebrate this today. The girl will not come, but um, uh, the, she has another appointment there. So what we will do tomorrow morning is we go to this church then, right? And after the church we can celebrate. Okay, okay very good. Thank you. Okay, that was one thing. Now we want to look at... Um, uh, we want to go on with the review of the test, but before we do that, we want to have contemporary issues. Um, are there any contemporary issues um, which we should talk about? That means to apply to it. Time diagnosis. Time diagnosis and time prognosis is uh, part of the vocabulary of the critical theory. So the critical theory is always connected with what is happening immediately. So what is happening? Is there anything happening? We uh, discussed the last time already the Pope thing there, but what we want to do today is to uh, uh, think about what you suggested there, that we take into consideration where these critical theories come from. And um, we said already that the critical theory has different layers. So it has a psychoanalytical layer where Hegel's psychology is transformed in terms of Freud. Uh, so um, it has also an economic layer. Um, Hegel has already Adam Smith in him, size and, and so on, all the uh, uh, political economists, uh, Hegel had that, and Marx just continues that work. So the critical theory has also has its economic dimension, psychological dimension, the sociological dimension, which is most important for us here, and then an anthropological, cultural anthropological thing, namely the, the culture, the art, uh, literature, and, and music, and so on. And then also a theological type. They were theologically interested uh, and, uh, in their Judaism and Christianity and Buddhism and so on. But one thing, one important thing, was the philosophy of history. I had a discussion in Frankfurt with the Frankfurt School people, and they were very upset that Habermas had forgotten this or uh, changed this philosophy of history. <laughs> he had replaced it simply with evolution, with the concept of evolution like Parsons, his friend, had done. So, but um, let's for a moment, uh, you know, do time diagnosis, but in such a way that we use it or do it on the level of the philosophy of history or theory of history. Uh, so, and that can mean either an ideology, ideology idealistic philosophy of history with an idealistic presupposition which means reason governs the world, providence governs the world. If you want to say it philosophically it means Anaxagoras reason governs the world. If you want to do it um, uh, uh, philosophically uh, or religiously then you would say providence governs the world. That is the idealistic presupposition. Remember what ID 
idealism means according to Lenin and so on idealism means that you presuppose something before nature and man and his history if you do that you are an idealist in that sense all religious people are idealists um, a materialist is a man who starts with nature <coughs> and nature is immediate and it is not mediated that means not created by anybody but it is just there and we start from there we start with man evolving out of nature human organism and that's where flesh comes from man dies like an animal and so on <laughs> but then um, man evolves beyond this <laughs> and um, so then of course another dimension comes up the dimension of spirit or the dimension of human consciousness and, and all this So, and that is what history is concerned with so, um, and so we, we can talk about philosophy of history in the Marxist sense, and Horkheimer has that, Adorno, they all have a philosophy of history still. They transformed Hegel's idealistic philosophy of history into a materialistic one, but it still has components in common. So let's use this philosophy of history in order to do our time diagnosis. So we did already do this, we discussed already the Pope there. Let me recapitulate that very simply. So the Roman Catholic Church has a resignation. Uh, Benedict resigned. They had to vote in a new um, new pope. Um, the newspapers here, two newspapers, and uh, and also a radio station. Uh, uh, they asked me what was to be expected, and I said, you know, that the conclave, that means the group of cardinals, 115. Uh, had been appointed by the two last popes and they were very conservative and they would be as conservative probably the new guy as they are so that was my point but I said there's the Holy Spirit at work and therefore a miracle could happen and they could vote somebody in from Africa or from South America or whatever and in a certain sense that miracle has happened so um, they got somebody in who was in the running already eight years ago but he uh, at that time stepped back and let Ratzinger go ahead of it because he wasn't healthy and um, or what other reasons there may have been. But now, eight years later, <coughs> he um, uh, accepted. So and when he accepted, um, so they voted for him and after he was voted in, he was asked if he wants to do the job and he said he would and uh, then right away he had to give himself a new name so he gave himself a new name the name is uh, Francis that is Francis of Assisi and Francis of Assisi we mentioned already belongs into the 13th century that is the beginning of capitalism his fa father was a capitalist a small capitalist and uh, somehow Francis saw the contradiction between the Sermon on the Mount and capitalism and one day he threw all his clothes into the face of his father and stood naked on the marketplace of a city and the bishop came and put the pluvial, his raincoat which he got from the senators around him that he wouldn't be too naked there and then he developed this radical imitation of Christ as Fromm would say Jesus was a man of being not of having and Fromm uses the story of temptation where Satan represents having uh, uh, bread alone, uh, God alone, uh, um, without any uh, natural law and so on, and power alone. So that was the temptation of, uh, of Satan. Satan represents the having mode, Jesus represents the being mode. And St. Francis is the greatest saint of the West in that sense that he imitated Jesus like no other did in the most concrete and almost literal type of a way. <laughs> so, and I told you an example there, two examples. One was that uh, he came from Spain, back from Spain. He also went to the East there and some kind of a crusade of his own. But when he came back to Assisi, he um, saw that the brothers had moved into a new house and he gave order that they would move out right away. And even the sick brothers had to go out. So that means Francis saw what would come out of private poverty. At that time, private poverty was already 10,000 years old. It started with farming, and owning of land, and so on and so on. Then it produced the class system. It produced the uh, so-called just wars, wars of thievery, and so on. 
which go on up to this moment there. We went to Vietnam to get rubber. We went to El Salvador in order to get coffee. We went to Iraq in order to get oil. And so on. we got oil, two-thirds of it. So um, that is all connected with private poverty. But with modern capitalism, then, it uh, becomes exaggerated in a certain sense. It is the private poverty not only of a house or so, but private poverty of the means of production, of tools, with these tools we can conquer nature, but who owns the tools can also subjugate others under his command and can press surplus value out of him. Somehow, uh, in a very early stage, St. Francis and also St. Dominicus and so on saw what was coming, the horror in which we live now, that horror. They foresaw this, that it would unfold, and uh, so opposed it by beggar orders. Both created beggar orders with a uh, rule which excluded private poverty. <laughs> and Francis went so far that he didn't even want to have private poverty for the order. And Pope Innocent, the most uh, powerful, Innocent III, most powerful Pope of the Middle Ages, forced him to, um, to uh, accept poverty for the order. And so so um, that is a very radical thing. That would be the, the whole thing of which... Uh, <coughs> In the 20th century, my pastor was involved, you know, to study what the mission of these monks was, the uh, the Benedictine order, and then later on the beggar orders. Uh, they represent very often things which happened outside the the uh, uh, in southern France. We had certain sects that were radical. They were also about poverty, poverty, and so on. And so the same thing: what happened outside of the church then happens inside of the church in a non-heretical way. The Jesuits the same way, uh, the Puritans outside, the Jesuits are the Puritans inside of the church, so inside of the Catholic Church. <coughs> okay, so that is what the Pope did, and uh, now uh, the, the, uh, in the meantime we have heard other things, and I have put material together more than we knew last week, so of course it's of the Jesuit order, uh, the Jesuit order is the foundation of Ignatius of Loyola, a soldier, a Spanish soldier, who wounded in the war, came home and then had time to reconsider and had a conversion, and then developed this order, quite different from the earlier ones. <coughs> no uh, uh, walls anymore around the monastery or whatever. Every Jesuit is an individualist, operates on his own. Every Jesuit has to uh, study six, seven years theology, then six or seven years economics. The people who were killed in El Salvador, the Jesuits, the six, they were all specialists in economics and studied the fascist system very well. That's why they were killed. Uh, or they become medical doctors or become scientists of some kind and so on. So their main task was to, uh, to protect the papacy. And this is the first time that uh, a Jesuit himself entered the, um, uh, and he could do that only with the permission of his order. <laughs> and that shows the, extens uh, the extension of the crisis in which the Church is. I would say that the crisis is so enormous that it is not enough anymore for the Jesuit order to stay outside and protect the papacy, but that they had to get into the papacy itself. Um, so then, um, the, as far as his past is concerned, <coughs> he is an Italian, he speaks Italian. Um, his father and mother were Italians, they emigrated to Argentine. He was a railroad worker, maybe, uh, maybe I don't know how high he came up or so, but an Italian in Argentine, the railroad, he probably did not uh, just clean out cars or whatever, but had some kind of a supervisor position, it doesn't say it really. Um, he had two brothers and a sister. Um, he uh, uh, did some good things. He sided with the poor. He did not take his limousine, the big cardinal limousine, but he went to the bus usually, <coughs> like everybody else. He um, uh, also did not live in his palace. He moved out of the palace and lived in the, uh, um, uh, in the uh, an apartment. So that is all somehow consistent with St. Francis and his message of poverty and so on. But there are some uh, some shady sides, and critical theory means to look dialectically at religion and not only <coughs> the good things which somebody may present, but also the bad things. There are bad things. 
The bad thing is that Argentine was under fascist control for some time when he was Archbishop already. And um, during this time, uh, like fascists do, like they have done in Chile and they have done in El Salvador and so on, in El Salvador the fascists have killed 72,000 members of the liberation uh, of the uh, uh, Christian basic communities and uh, a lot of priests of the liberation theologians and so on. So something like that happened in Argentine as well. <laughs> it is not the case anymore. I think the, uh, the president now is a woman. Um, she just visited the Pope and they had a nice talk. The Pope even kissed her, which excited the whole Western press. <laughs> and uh, so she asked him for help uh, uh, against England because there is the Falkland Islands are still in discussion and the British want to have it and the Argentinians say it belongs to them and um, therefore he wa she wants to have the the, uh, um, the help of the Pope. I think she was one of the victims too who were tortured. So nevertheless there are two priests, uh, the, the Cardinal and now the Pope said that he warned them <laughs> that the uh, fascists were after them uh, and uh, that then when they were caught that he went to the military junta and spoke for them but that it had no effect. The two priests who are still alive, they survived their, their torture. They say uh, one of them uh, is in Argentine still, another one is in Germany now, he never returns to Argentine. The Pope also speaks German because he studied in Frankfurt. And Frankfurt is a center, a Jesuit school center, in which I was supposed to go, but I rather prefer to go to a public university. So I went to Mainz instead, but this was really my destiny. And when I came home as a prisoner of war, I watched that place. I was a watchman for them at night. I was paid for this. And since the Allies made a law that Germans could not carry weapons, I had something which was called an armpost. I don't know what this name is. It's an arrow. Uh, it's not just bow and arrow. It is a special what Wilhelm Tell had in Switzerland when he shot at the apple. Um, the crossbow? Huh? The crossbow? Crossbow. I don't know what the real name is. It's quite a quite a complicated instrument. But the principle is bow and arrow. So with the trigger. With the trigger. Yeah. yeah crossbow. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I had, and I sneaked at night through the bushes and looked for thieves and to put a little arrow into their backside or whatever. <laughs> but it never happened. I was, I was a deterrent because I was there. They didn't even curse me. So uh, nevertheless, that's where he studied several years in the Jesuit place and that's where he learned his German. So he speaks Italian and Argentinian, Spanish, and then he speaks uh, German as well, which is very nice to get around with. So, <coughs> nevertheless, this priest in Germany said he had uh, celebrated a mass together with the cardinal and uh, then they had uh, reconciled themselves and he had forgiven the uh, the cardinal and then at that time and that means that something bad happened and that means that if you don't forgive anybody if he is not has not done something wrong so the priests and others probably think that the uh, archbishop did something wrong uh, that means that he was did not defend him enough. So same charges which we have against the Pius the Twelfth um, with Hitler that he didn't speak up for the Jews and uh, the people still want to have today that the Pope should repent this and uh, <coughs> that he hasn't done that. So now we have to be careful with this. You know, whoever knows fascism, fascism is different from civil, uh, from liberalism and from liberal society and from socialistic society. They are very tough. Uh, fascists are low bourgeois uh, creeps and they are doing what they say. Um, the socialists may do that too, but uh, liberals seldom do what they say. You have it just today again. They want to do something against weapons, their gun, gun control, and though they, they eliminated it today, they don't vote on it. And so, so there are these 20 children there, they were murdered and butchered, and it's still not enough, and they still don't do anything. So this split between theory and praxis, that is typical for the liberals. And, and Hitler made the best of that and said, look, they are babbling, babbling around and don't get anywhere. And so and so uh, that's how he came in in the first place. So this, uh, <coughs> uh, see, but the fascists are doing it, and they are 
are doing it in a brutal way in terms of the aristocratic law of nature, the superiority of some people over others, some race over others, one gender over the other, and so on. And, so, um, and it is an atmosphere which is hard to describe uh, uh, as far as, you know, uh, acting or talking. There is no discourse, really, you know, they always know what is right and that has to be done, and you cannot talk with them. And um, as far as religion is concerned, if uh, they can make use of it, they make use of it. If they cannot make use of it, then they martyrize uh, the, the Christians as they do the Jews and, and so on, and are very brutal to them, and that happened to those two priests. And so did did the, the Archbishop really have the power? And that depends, you know, on on his believers around him, if they establish for him a power group. So you know, a good example is uh, the Cardinal of uh, the, Arch the Bishop of Münster, Karl von Gaal, and he was the only one who really fully resisted Hitler. He wrote uh, in uh, wrote letters uh, which were um, printed out primitively and they were spread all over Germany against concentration camps. So there was somebody who did something against it and he at the same time also criticized the Allies' uh, bombardments of the cities where they killed hundreds of thousands of women and children. And, uh, so, uh, but he could do that <coughs> because he had a whole diocese full of people who were in the German Air Force who had uh, shot down 50 uh, allied bombers and so on and so had a high status in society and so they wouldn't dare to touch that bishop because all these people all these officers of high rank they would have uh, mounted around and shouted around so Goebbels never dared to touch him that was too risky so in that sense he had a real power base I don't mean arms or whatever I mean what we call power that you have a consensus among mass of people were standing behind you, and uh, so the question how guilty uh, the, uh, the president's power was in these things depends on how much power he really had and how much he could risk and what the consequences are. If you, you know, uh, if you, the Germans and, and the Italian Catholics, they have the Lateran Treaty with Mussolini. Mussolini established the church state where they are sitting in now. Uh, Garibaldi, 1870, had taken the church state away. If you saw the movie of the um, Alexander the Sixth, for instance, the Borgias and so on, then you will see the the Pope wanted to extend his state all all over Italy, and he did this to Lucrezia Borgia, who married again and again, and then poisoned the husband, and then they got the next one, and she married him again, and her brother arranged all that. So. That was the ambition to make large parts of Italy into the church state. Garibaldi, a nationalist, Italian nationalist, uh, cancelled the whole church state and pushed the uh, Pope back into the Vatican. So for so, so many decades, the Pope did not even go out, out of the Vatican. He was a prisoner in the Vatican. Then by 1920s or so, the Lateran Treaty was established in which Mussolini got the support of the church, and for that support, he established the church state as a sovereign state. It is not a democratic state. It is a, a theocracy. It is an absolute monarchy. It is an aristocracy and has only one moment of democracy. And that is that even a little guy from a railroad worker can make it up to the top. That is a democratic thing. But otherwise, it is as undemocratic as one can think. It is an authoritarian type of a church in the classical sense of the word. So, <coughs> now, when we look at this, you know, in terms of the philosophy of history, read of Hegel or Marx or so, <coughs> then um, for Hegel, let's start out with him. Um, history uh, had three parts, like, you know, the dialectic of thinking. That means, first was uh, the reason governs the world, reason governs history, uh, and and uh, providence governs history. Uh, B, uh, that's A, then B, if reason or providence governs history, then it has a goal, and then under this goal, the uh, part of this goal is B, A, uh, or B, 1, 
that would mean man's freedom nature, which was only a potential, but which in history has slowly to be developed. C, which has to be developed through agents of change, which could be great men, or for Marx then, a whole class of people, and that uh, change has to take place in a certain material, and that material is the social system. Uh, what is changed by the agent of change is the personality, the family, the civil society, the state, the historical process, the culture, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the art, the religion, and, and the, the philosophy, and the science. So everything is changed by these agents of change. And then comes A, B, and now comes C, is the cause of history. And the cause of history for Eagle was, one was free, like in Africa, the king of the tribes or whatever, <coughs> and the magician, one was free, and the others were all his poverty. And uh, then in Asia, if, uh, uh, still one is free, in China, the emperor, and so on, in Persia. And then with Greece, the uh, new principle comes in, a few are free. 4,000 free in Athens, 100,000 slaves. Kennedy thought that this was the great ideal of a democracy. I hope not. That would mean, you know, that one, f it would mean 4,000 free guys, and, and then the others are all uh, slaves. So, <coughs> so, but then few are slaveholders first, the few are feudal lords for a thousand years, and now the few are capitalists. That means not, we are not a free country. The free country, what, what they do here all the time is they take this Hegelian, and that is right-wing Hegelianism, they take this Hegelian idea of the freedom of all, not the freedom of the one, not the few, but the freedom of all, and transform that, which comes from Christianity mainly, but from all three Abrahamic religions, that the freedom of all is made into an ideology which then legitimates the freedom of the few. That is the dirty trick. That is the pseudon proton. That's the first lie. That's the lie on which all the propaganda is done again and again. Free country, free country, etc. On what free? Is it the freedom of the one? Is it the freedom of the few or the freedom of the all? It is the freedom of the few. The freedom of all has not happened. It has not happened here and it has not happened in the Soviet Union nor has it happened anywhere else. So that is the future which is supposed to come. For Hegel, <coughs> that future was situated in the Americas or in the Slavic world. In 50 years I'm traveling back and forth between the American world and the Slavic world in order to study the evolutionary potential of these two and who will make it. According to Hegel, both could make it or one would make it against the other in a competitive way. But uh, the, uh, uh, the reason why I came here was that I believe very strongly that, uh, as Hegel did, that Europe was finished. And uh, that means, in a historical term, that it had moved into the niche. That um, when I was asked in Greece, when I taught uh, uh, in, in the University of Ioannina, the professors asked me if the Germans had known his, uh, Hegel's philosophy of history, if I had read it more, would they have done what they did under Hitler? I said they would not have done it, because they would have known that it was an anachronism, that it was late. So that means whoever was once in the light of history and then moved into the niche will never come out of the niche again. So that means Africa will never come into the foreground again. That means China, uh, no matter how rich it gets, it will not move into the foreground again. Uh, but uh, the Slavic world and the uh, American world never were at the front of the evolutionary process. Or they have the greatest uh, evolutionary potential. The Russians played always some kind of a strange role for Europe. That means they kept the Asian invasions of uh, Genghis Khan and uh, uh, um, the, uh, the first one, what was his name? The, the, the guy of the 4th century, the 4th century and the 12th century, these were two uh, Asian campaigns which broke through. The Genghis Khan went into France, the other one was... What? Tamerlane? 
Yeah, yeah. the first one who, who met the Pope there in the Piava River and, and then went back and got a heart attack in, at the Danube there. Um, Attila. Yeah, Attila. Oh, was Attila the, one, the yeah. first one, Attila the Hunnan. And then, so nobody knows what influence the Pope had on this guy, but he turned around. <coughs> he did not cross the river, so and went back to the Danube and then celebrated his, I don't know how many weddings and got a heart attack. He was always strange to poor guy. <coughs> so, but that was the function of the Russians. They kept a lot of other attacks, which would also have hit in Europe. They kept it back. And therefore, it is so painful for a Russian when you tell him he's not a European. Because Europe would not exist without them. This little peninsula which hangs there on Asia could never have made it if you had not all these forces west of the Ural who uh, resisted these breakthroughs there or stopped them or they came only halfway or whatever. So uh, that, uh, and therefore it did never have a history on its own. Uh, it borrowed a lot from uh, Peter the Great. He went to Holland and, and uh, uh, learned a lot and brought a lot of Germans and others, uh, Dutch, uh, into Russia in order to modernize them and so on. But it has never come really into its own. And the same thing is true for us. I mean, uh, we, uh, you know, the First World War, we entered the stage of history the first time going to the Normandy here for the Colonel Westnitz here he marched personally over there never came back again he got a lung infection over there and he's buried near Borges Hospital I think mm -hmm. and that's where he's buried <coughs> and, uh, but then the Second World War was of course a repetition of it but a powerful entrance of the uh, uh, historical process and uh, Hegel predicted exactly that and people in 1945 they were amazed that the uh, uh, professor or the president of the University of Berlin um, that he could predict that when on one side the Russian armies marched in and the other side the uh, American forces came in uh, in the middle of Europe. So how can one make predictions like that? First of all by a thorough knowledge of the facts of history <coughs> as much as one can and Hegel was the best read philosopher of his time <coughs> in the natural sciences and also in the social sciences as far as they existed and then the dialectical method so the combination of these two makes predictions possible and uh, so now if we take this view of history and look at the Pope thing there, the time diagnosis then it is amazing that he is the first Pope who comes from the Americas um, and he always thought in terms of both Americas, not only of North America. <coughs> he, um, he, uh, he requires that we do not treat South and Central America as colonies any further. They are our colonies, like the Philippines and so on, um, but that they would become equal. And uh, today, in terms of the world market, we really need both Americas to be combined, like a united Europe or so, in order to really be able to compete. <coughs> so. The, uh, so th that this happens in church history is amazing and of course the Pope before the last one came from the Slavic world so that means he came from uh, from, from Poland so um, that means what happens in church history uh, in a strange way uh, fits very well into this uh, uh, philosophy of history as we have it um, uh, with Hegel and of course Marx thought very highly of America as well uh, the American Republic and the experiment here was an, an important uh, uh, historical step. Um, he did not think so much about Russia, and that was uh, that was somewhat ironically that ironical that in Russia uh, his theory was experimented on. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we have that this thinking continues. So. <laughs> if you think, you know, the Balt Balkan War and so on, who was there, we were there, you know. When with Iran now, Israel has to ask for permission if they can attack Iran or not. And you see, that is what the world historical powers do, who move to the front. They have to carry all the burdens, and they depend on others helping them. If you look at our Nobel Prize people here in science or what, you'll see that most of them have not been educated here. They all come from England or from Germany or from somewhere else and were naturalized. 
Um, so that is what what the uh, front runner has the right to. That when the Romans went to the full ground, the Greeks came as slaves, but as teachers at the same time. The, the slaves educated the Romans. They gave all the education and so on to the Romans who were in the front. And what the Romans had done, the Benedictines and so on gave to the feudal lords of Europe, whatever the knowledge, the veil, and the Renaissance that the old goes even on. But it went on through the whole Middle Ages. <coughs> so that means if we look at this philosophy of history, then it is some kind of some affirmative of it that, at least as far as church history is concerned, we have uh, outreaching toward the Eastern Europe, toward the Slavic world. Uh, so one pope was a Slav, and the other one now is really an Italian, but uh, he's nevertheless uh, uh, spent his whole life, grew up in in, uh, in Argentine. So uh, that may be enough for for this type of a time diagnosis. Now, uh, we can. Is there any other question concerning this or any comment to it? We have become very skeptical in terms of philosophy of nature, of course, but also philosophy of um, of history as well. But I think the Frankfurt people are right against Habermas that maybe one should not uh, abandon it prematurely and should see if something of this philosophy of history can be uh, can be rescued. Okay, now uh, if you don't have anything then, then we can look at the Cyprus thing there that has, seems not to have anything to do with religion and that is fine. But when we look at it, it has something to do with religion anyway. It's not my fault. Okay. What is happening in Cyprus? Cyprus crisis. I have some European journalists here who say it's a little bit clearer. What is happening there? What happened in Cyprus? Isn't it the case that Cyprus is asking for money from the EU? Yeah. And... Um, uh, one of the conditions that seems to be dollars. right that have been yeah. put on it is that they uh, up the amount or some kind of fee or tax or yeah. something on bank accounts, savings accounts, which yeah. of course has angered the Russians, okay, so considering the, yeah. that's where they put their money. Right, that's a whole story, right? Yeah. So I mean, the in Brussels, the Brussels uh, want to bail them out. They would give them ten billion dollars, but they would have to pay something too. And so they wanted to take that money which they need, 10% from the bank accounts, and they wanted to take it from the smaller bank accounts. And they don't have that what we have here, that your accounts are protected, let's say up to $100,000. Uh, many banks have that, so you, whatever you have, whatever happens there, you keep the $100,000. But above it, that will go. So, But the process demanded from Cyprus to um, to pay, uh, that means to liquidate these bank accounts. And the banks are closed now already. They will be closed next Tuesday. Uh, it, it means people cannot go into the banks, people cannot pay anybody when they are dependent on the banks, and so on. So the whole thing stands still. But the parliament in Nicosia has rejected the process thing uh, because it's too furious. So. Uh, they thought maybe that they could make it in a progressive way. That means the richer you are, the more you have to pay, and the poorer you are, the less you have to pay. <laughs> and so if you have not more than 100,000 or whatever, you have not to pay anything or whatever. But all that was rejected by the parliament. So that was yesterday. And now the tremendous panic has struck, you know, who will bail them out? And uh, so Russia came in now. Here, our friend there, um, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the fellow Putin there took the opportunity. <laughs> the reason for that is that they were oligarchs. They are oligarchs now in uh, in Russia, like we have oligarchs. They rule the whole thing here, so the capitalists. And uh, Putin has distanced himself from them. The previous were not they embraced them more, but he has put some of them in prison. But he is not willing to put more into prison. As a matter of fact, he doesn't want to make too many enemies, so he is willing to help Cyprus in order to rescue all these Russian accounts. And they're not only the oligarchs, but they're also criminals. So there is uh, money laundering going on, 
and other. There are continually billions flowing into Cyprus and out again, and uh, and Russia is involved in that. <laughs> uh, and Russia wants to have something for that. It has at the moment only one harbor, and that is in Syria, uh, where it can anchor its fleet. They accept the Black Sea, but that is in the Ukrainian territory now. So it would like to have a military harbor in Cyprus, and of course the Europeans don't like that at all. And then that he, you know, is superior to the European Union, that the European Union cannot do it, and he can do it, and uh, uh, Russia is very, do the Slavic world is doing very well uh, because of the gas lines and the oil lines, and they have tremendous income, so their debt is much lower than that of the European Union or ours, so it's minimal really. So they are doing very well, and uh, they can offer this now, and the European Union cannot do it, or has been rejected. That is uh, a thing of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, great concern. Now, <laughs> the funny thing is the church is involved anyway. So um, there is the Orthodox Church. So it is the second paradigm of Christianity, by right? the Orthodox Church. So there is an Orthodox Archbishop on Cyprus who is very much connected to the Patriarch of Moscow. <coughs> and the Archbishop has asked, you know, the Patriarch in Moscow to make connection with Putin and motivate him to help Cyprus. But the Church also has uh, given up, uh, has uh, presented its whole property on Cyprus in order to bail out uh, Cyprus, the banks, to break the banks out. They are closed. And so that they can open again. They want to give all the property of the monasteries and the dioceses and so on. They want to give it all in order to bail things out. So there is religion returning somewhere. And of course the Germans say, well, why doesn't the Vatican do that? <laughs> they, want, they want the Vatican to take over all the German debts or whatever. Or at least the debts, uh, the, the, um, the Cyprus disaster played over from Greece because they are close connections, but there is now the same thing happening in Italy and in Spain and in Portugal. So none of these governments is able to protect itself from state bankruptcy, whatever that will mean. Uh, the banks are closed forever. So <coughs> that is the uh, issue. Now when we look at this, you know, time diagnosis, and we could go further and further into this, <coughs> including Russia there, we see Russia again, right? So we see that Europe is not really able to do something about this, so there comes the Slavic world, comes into it. At that moment, we are not active there, at least not openly. It seems that our um, uh, the German trade seems to be very low too, and nothing is mentioned of us at all. So, But there is something between Europe having moved into the niche and suddenly the Slavic world entering the picture, and maybe solving the problem. We will see what happens. So, if we take that philosophy of history, we see that it shows us some way, some direction there into which things are going, and maybe even according to that ought to go, because A, providence governs the world, or reason governs the world. That means not only a purpose, it means also a plan, and it means all the steps in the plan. So, history makes sense uh, it has a goal, and the great problem is, of course, the means. The, uh, that means the great man, for instance, because of that is this middle realm there is where all the horrors are happening, all the killings, all the murderings, and so on. And there is Hegel's theodicy, right? So the theodicy is <laughs> that um, one cannot be inductive. <laughs> He says they are all your damned pessimists, you know, like Schopenhauer and so on, and you wallow in these terrible things, you know, that the most beautiful empires go down and the most virtuous people are ruined and, and the good are punished and the bad get away and so on and so on. But in reality, you are not interested in this, really. You are not interested to resolve this. You are just interested to, to be happy with it. And there are people who are happy when they can be negative all the time. It makes them feel good when they're negative. It lifts up their ego when they're negative. So, therefore, Hegel would say, no, not being inductive, but deductive. That means you have to go into A in order to solve that realm of means by which history is moved toward freedom. You have to start from the beginning, namely reason governs the world. 
and a reason governing the world uh, negates these negations all the time. It has negated these negations. So, an example in the 20th century would be, you know, this horrendous, victorious march of Hitler in the West, and, and so on and so on, and then comes this horrible disaster, which you can see if you want to, we can look at it. So, uh, from, from this type of philosophy of history, means uh, sometimes uh, the guy may commit those crimes and so on, but uh, the, uh, what is it, the, uh, comes back to pre, to, what, what, did, what did Malcolm X say about Kennedy? The chickens come home the to roost. come home to roost, yeah, right. And I thought that with these gun laws there, they, 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 they were so upset that the Congress could not come to a conclusion and didn't want to vote on this because there were these 20 people, 20 children, and they had the pictures of the children with these assault guns and so on and so on, and they flashed, you know, how many of those children were murdered in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. So the, the chickens are coming home to us, but you cannot say it, really. You, you're not allowed to say it, so because they, they don't like you anymore. So the, when Malcolm X said that, he was finished, you know, in this country and so on because of it. So one has to be very careful. But what it really means is that world history is also world judgment. And that whatever, whoever, as Jesus would say, whoever takes a weapon will be killed by a weapon. Whoever takes the thought will be killed by the thought. So therefore be careful to take up a thought because it will hit you. Or in other terms, whoever does not fulfill the golden rule, uh, do to others as you want to have done to you, right away elicits the lex talionis, that means of the use talionis, the right to revenge. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, leg for leg, foot for foot, and so on. So uh, the, the guys who killed uh, Saddam who there, not Saddam, the other one there, Bin Laden, uh, they, they crashed, uh, many of them crashed in a helicopter two weeks later and were shot down by somebody and so on. So um, it may not work all the time, but you know, we, we want to be critical about this philosophy of history too, in particular that the art of the problem is a real problem. And if the system, you know, has exploded, it has exploded over this, uh, over this thing. Hegel thought, you know, that philosophy was really the place where the theodicy problem was to, was to be solved. Today, uh, uh, no world religion can solve the theodicy problem. No philosophy can. So, in that sense, Hegel is that cursed optimist, Schopenhauer called him, that cursed optimist, and his optimism is theological. That means that reason, divine reason, that human reason, and uh, providence uh, um, uses or <coughs> negates these negations and uh, makes sure that even the negative serves this ultimate goal. And there is uh, the friend of Hegel, Goethe, has in Faust there, where Mistopolis is the one who always does the bad, but also can does the good, you know, without uh, wanting it or whatever. So that uh, the, the Satan is ambiguous. So the negative if is also the positive. It's the fundamental sentence of negative of, of dialectic logic. I mean, I say to Mike Art, he gets desperate about this, but uh, it is a fundamental principle. The negative is also the positive. So whatever negative there is, it elicits also the good which negates it, and out of this comes an affirmation. And we saw that there is in the philosophy of history, you know, Adorno um, didn't go along with Hegel and changed it. <coughs> the whole dialectic tradition long before Hegel said negation of the negation is affirmation. And then they had this experience that fascism was negated, but it didn't need, lead to something affirmative. It lead to, led to restoration. That means that civil society out of which fascism had come in the same pla first place had to be restored again. Therefore, one had to expect that fascism would come again. And we have this uh, guy there who did this long talk there in, in, uh, in the uh, Senate there a few weeks ago there with Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul, yeah. Uh, for years and years he has warned about this, that uh, if there is a crisis and things become unstable, then people may vote for Hitler. He says, there is no Hitler yet around here, but someday they may, if that goes on, that chaos here, uh, they may vote for somebody and then the transition from liberalism to, um, to uh, fascism will come about. And he always thinks of not only Hitler, but of the Weimar Republic to how similar we are to the Weimar Republic, which also couldn't talk, uh, couldn't get anywhere, all the talking and so on. But there are also great differences. They 
had not frozen the parties into two parties as we have done. They had too many parties, and uh, that did not help the process. So that was one factor. <coughs> okay, so um, that as far as the Cyprus situation is concerned, we see also here again that European Europe cannot help itself. Uh, it has moved in the niche. If you are in the niche, I mean, Greece is in the niche for a long time. Egypt is in the niche, and Persia is in the niche. They are all in the niche, and uh, uh, you can live a good life. As a matter of fact, a better life even than when you are the front runner. Because when you are the front runner, you have a tremendous job to do, uh, for which you need all the help. And one thing the front runner is doing, very often he destroys the ones who are in back behind him. That's what the Romans did, of course, and that's what the Persians did, and that's what we do. Uh, think of Iraq, that is the, the birthplace of our civilization, you know, and we annihilated it. We bombed out the whole infrastructure, there's nothing left of it. And the war continues now, after we are gone. And so so um, the same thing we did to Afghanistan. So the same did the British did to, to the Near East and Africa. And so that means the front runner uh, pushes the others into the niche or even annihilates them in the niche. And we do that very perfectly, and so, so day after day. So, uh, <laughs> the, um, so the, the question is, you know, how much truth is there in this philosophy of history? But um, you know, if it is true or not, the question is, does it help us to do time diagnosis so that we don't stand blindly before all these facts and say, oh, this, that, oh, this, that, but that we can look through it and understand some of it, and so that we can say that the Roman Catholic Church suddenly leaves Europe and goes to the Slavic world or goes to the American world or that we have the Balkan War and we have to be born, not torn in because we are still occupying there uh, because they couldn't deal with it and, and so on. Uh, that seems to affirm this. But we have to do that warning of Adorno because Adorno went to the, the negative dialectics. Hegel talked about, about positive and negative dialectics. And uh, so uh, Adorno uh, reflects on that experience that the negation of the negation did not leave a mission. So therefore, we cannot be sure, for instance, in Christianity, that the negation of the negation, Jesus' resurrection, has really happened. Uh, that's a matter of faith, but nobody knows if it has happened. So the negation of the negation may just have been uh, nothing, whatever. The Messiah didn't come, and so on. So. That means that there is no necessity with which something affirmative must arise out of something negative. That's why my God also the positive is the negative. If somebody uh, the negative is the positive. If somebody is really in the negative and uh, and suffers a lot and so on, that sounds like scorn. It sounds like uh, you know abhorrent or atrocious. Or so. And somebody says, don't worry, the negative is also the positive, and so on. But if one steps back and so on, and uh, uh, one can see that sometimes at least it happens, and all that what we see, saw on the piano guy, and, and what we saw in the conspiracy, and so on, you know, they had their day of judgment. But you could argue right away, but there were also many of them were rescued, you know, in the German Federal Republic, and they got new offices again, and they did the most horrible thing, and then they appeared again and had a good a good time. And after all the crimes the Germans did, then they had the miracle, the economic miracle, and lived like kings, and, and so on and so on. So um, it is an ambiguous thing. So we just want to see if that philosophy of history or what is ever left in its materialistic and idealistic form if it helps us to make an, uh, some kind of a time diagnosis, that means that it helps us to think about this instead of sit sitting there thoughtlessly and letting all these events just passing by without understanding or comprehending anything. <coughs> okay, so then we have a last one, last contemporary issue. I let that go around. You can look at these pictures there. In Cyprus, there are big signs against capitalism, to hell with capitalism, wonderful pictures there. So, uh, but the church's activity is a very nice here, yeah, put in too. So, the last thing now is uh, this one here. There are these two nice faces there, uh, and that is, of course, our uh, friends there, Netanyahu, Netanyahu, Netanyahu and the president are meeting there right now.
not visit Israel in the first four years, and now he has visited them. He will go to Jordan afterwards, and he will also go to the West Bank, Ramallah, and uh, also visit the authority there. Uh, I have done this already today. Um, so he um, landed there in Tel Aviv in the airport, and somebody said, we have to follow the red line. And they made jokes about it with Nos Netanyahu has always says we have to draw a red line. <laughs> <laughs> the president asked, where the hell is the red line? <laughs> After the first parade or whatever, he wanted to see the red line where he could march and so on. So, um, well, the, uh, he will, I, I think the people on the street did not gather. There was no jubilation on the streets when the president came. Uh, the uh, Israelis said, you know, he doesn't like us, we don't like him, so we stay at home. So, And the reason for that is that he, uh, first of all, the president is very upset about the settlements going on. That means Netanyahu has continually increased the settlements in territories which should really belong to a, 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 a later state of, um, of Israel. Uh, later state of uh, Palestine state, Palestinian state and uh, that is one thing, the other one is that he doesn't give the right to fly to um, to bomb Iran um, the president still thinks there's a diplomatic way to do that and Netanyahu would go there and like to bomb and have some buses there, they do some bombs which can go into the depth there and uh, so on so and the president holds him back well, first of all, we see again, you know, that uh, somehow America is in the, I mean, what is America doing in the Near East? Um, why they uh, are somehow, uh, you know, friendly to the president is he gave them a new weapon, um, which was the Iron Dome. And these Iron Domes, they are, uh, they are supposed to have shut down 80% of the rockets which the Palestinians sent into Palestine. So that is a new technical advance and we gave them that and it was tried out the first time. So um, it was, uh, they say, it was, uh, you know, very, um, very effective, uh, which of course the people, the Palestinians, should not be very happy about it because all their efforts to shoot little rockets, uh, the little Russian rockets you cannot they carry something, some explosives, but you cannot steer them really. <laughs> you have to just shoot them and then you have to hope for the best that they will hit somewhere and they didn't hit very often even before. And now if you take 80% out of them, they will even hit less. So um, that means we dismantled their whole <laughs> Palestinian force there. So that doesn't give us a good name. But I mean that we are there at all. The Germans are not there, the French are not there. It shows again, you know, that we uh, uh, we are present there. Obviously, America is present, and the Slavic world is present too. Uh, so, as we mentioned already, they have the only harbor they have in Syria where their fleet, the Mediterranean fleet, is stationed. And then they are also uh, opposing us in the Security Council, as far as Syria is concerned. Uh, they don't want to have any intervention. And we were very careful because we don't want to give weapon to the insurrectionists because they look very much like uh, like Hamas or Hezbollah or Al Qaeda and so on, and we don't want to give the weapons to the wrong people. But you know, these are all tremendously complicated. But there is no doubt that we have made out of Israel a huge fortress, um, and they represent our interests and they are connected with us. <laughs> and uh, they could pull us, you know, into a disaster as well if they do the, the wrong thing. <coughs> so, and uh, at the same time, we see also the Russians uh, present there, and they were, uh, of course, um, there was the whole connection of Afghanistan, where the Russians were there before we were there, and where we used, you know, uh, Al Qaeda and uh, the others, the, the Bin Laden. Uh, to fight the Russians. We gave the Russians the Stinger rockets with which they could shoot the Russian helicopters down, which brought uh, the end of the thing. So, also from the Arabic side, they are aware of it. They thought, I uh, mean, Laden thought, that the Russians had been driven out by them, and that that led to the end of uh, socialism, uh, the second modernization. And then they could 
turn against the first modernization, that is the American one, the bourgeois one, and uh, that is what's still going on to some extent. So um, we see that both the Slavic world and uh, uh, and the American world are very much present there, and uh, it seems to be so natural to us that this is the case. But uh, we could ask him, what the hell are they doing there, or why? And that people who are closer by are concerned with that. Why do these people come from so far away and get mixed up in these struggles? And the, uh, <laughs> the two forces, the Slavic and the American world, um, uh, are competing there for power. They are competing in Cyprus, for instance. Uh, according to the Hegelian philosophy, what do they really have to solve? See, if you have a new stage in the world historical process, what is the task? Uh, how do they bring us closer to the goal, which is the realm of freedom, uh, for Marx and for Hegel? Uh, well, uh, what they have to do is, uh, what they're supposed to do is to reconcile the particular and the universal in logical terms, but in more concrete terms, to reconcile the um, personal autonomy and universal solidarity, which is the title of one of my books, uh, that's why I put that title on there. Um, so, in the uh, Slavic world, you have this attempt to emphasize universal solidarity under socialism and so on, and before in a, in a traditional way. Um, and in America, you have this emphasis on personal autonomy. So, if you put it into an extreme logical terms, then the, the Russians had solidarity but no autonomy. And we have autonomy, but we have no solidarity. And because we have no solidarity, that's why we don't have a, a health program for all people. Even with Obamacare, we still have millions of people who don't have health insurance and so on. That would not be possible if we had solidarity. If we had solidarity, we would not have all these uh, soup kitchens. And uh, we would uh, care that we would have a system which would function and it would reach these people. Wherever we have people on food stamps, capitalism doesn't work. Wherever we have people who are in, in soup kitchens, capitalism doesn't work. Wherever we have people in slums, that's 4 million pe 40 million people, capitalism doesn't work. Uh, it is only the idiocy of the ruling class which is internalized into the masses that they can think even that capitalism works. In spite of the fact that they see in every town as slums, they see that it doesn't work and uh, then take the wrong measure what a good economy is, namely producing billionaires. A good economy would be, if you think civil society, need system, administration of justice, police and professional organizations, the basis is the need system. So a society has to be measured if it fulfills <coughs> the needs of food and housing, good food, not food which makes people sick for profit's sake, and, uh, and, and, and housing, and not losing all the houses for which one has worked for years and years, like it happened uh, in, in 2008, and then uh, uh, health insurance and education, and all is in shambles. So that it's always the question, you know, when we say uh, this or that is not good, then this is a judgment, right? When I say it's dark outside, this is not a judgment. That's a protocol sentence. But when I say the capitalistic system is not good, that is a judgment. Remember we say usually don't be judgmental? What do we do when we are judgmental? We uh, identify a thing with itself. We identify the family with what a family really is and ought to be. Or we identify civil society with itself. A civil society ought not to have all these slums and food kitchens and food stamps and so on, because it, it and there we see it ought not to be that way. This ought is a deduction from an idea of what the civil society is: need system, administration of justice, and uh, the policing of the whole thing. The policing and uh, the uh, professional organizations like the unions or whatever, uh, um, employers associations. That is the goal of the whole thing, in which the whole civil society controls itself and comes back to itself and then goes over into the state. And the state and civil society are very different, and civil society and the family are very different. <coughs> and, by the way, in Parsonian terms, there is room for further differences.
differentiation. So we should differentiate further uh, the family and civil society. We should not burden the family with what the civil society should do, because the civil society took the productive part out of the family, but left the caring part. Therefore, the civil society has to deal with the family so that it can do the caring part and not sending patients from the hospital home where there is no home and where there is nobody to take because the family has this integrated and so on. So, so the, uh, the, the, the issue, you know, to say don't uh, be judgmental um, could find a basis in the New Testament where Jesus says, you know, don't pass any judgment and so on. But he passed judgment on everything all the time, and so did the church all the time. So it is probably unavoidable that when we look at something as a, as a tree, you know, that we see that the tree is half sick. That means the tree does not conform to its being a tree. And uh, so I have some out there, which uh, obviously, or somebody has a, a sick body where some organs are not functioning. Everybody sees right away that something is wrong with this guy. When we go into family and we say, you know, this is not a family, they all hate each other or they don't talk with each other and so on, we have something, not only in our mind, but our mind reflects something. That is what Plato then, what they call the idea, which was either in heaven or which was with Aristotle in things themselves. And in that sense, Hegel is an Aristotelian, and so is Marx. They see the idea of things in themselves. So when Marx is upset about the horror of capitalism and puts his whole life work into it, then because this civil society contradicts itself, it's not itself. Like somebody does something horrible and says, I wasn't myself when I did this. Like this girl who is on trial now, there with having stabbed her lover a hundred times, twenty times or whatever. I was not myself, I didn't know who I was, what I was doing, I was not there, whatever. That means I was split in myself. My existence and my being human were disassociated from each other. And we do that all the time. So, in spite of the fact that we have, it has become unconscious for us. So, for instance, we continually use conclusions. I say the street is red. Ago, it must have rained, right? Or I hear, you know, that there is a certain sound from the cars. Ago, it must have frozen out there. See, automatically, you don't have to study logic in order to do that. We are just doing it all the time, you see. The same way we digest all the time without knowing anything about our digestive system. You don't have to read a book in medicine in order to digest the hamburger and so on. So that means the philosopher simply takes out what we are unconsciously doing all the time and makes it conscious. And that is, of course, what enlightenment is all about, right? to make that what is unconscious, conscious. We've we got about 20 uh, minutes. Do you want to... Uh, yeah, okay, moving? very good. So um, you have still a week or two, if you want to, to go on with that test there, right? And you have it in the meantime, too. And um, let's say we can maybe do without the third one, right? Uh, if you want to have a deep longing to have a third one, then we can still do it at the end, right? We are democratic group. So, okay, so which movie would you like to have? And we want to apply the same uh, philosophy of history to to that movie too, so. I'd be interested in seeing the way, what the way the conversation of today has gone. The wave? Yeah. Okay. I think that's what it's called, right? Justin, yeah. the wave, that is you. You are the wave specialist. Das ist alles in Deutsch. It's in Deutsch? Yeah, yeah, it's in Deutsch. Does it have subtitles? Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. Can we read the subtitles? Otherwise, we all <laughs> have to speak German. We <laughs> have to pray to the Holy Spirit <laughs> that He will overshadow us. And Gloria, Gloria. Yeah. Pentecost. Yeah, Pentecost. <laughs> Put it in? Sure. 
you don't say it in a very convincing way. Are you sure you can get it? Aya, aya. How about that? You don't get more convincing in German than you say aya. Yeah, yeah. You have seen it already? Alex? No? No. How can you long for something which you don't know? Well, the way you explain that. Well, this is people do it all the time. Your brief explanation of what it was about. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. 